Next talk is uh, by uh, Philippe Guillaume from University of Delaware on uh, something slightly different from the Henrik talk on the uh, Poros viscoelastic model for wave attenuation. Please, Philippe. All right, so good morning, everyone. Uh, first, I would like to thank the organizers, um, especially Emilian, for giving me the opportunity to speak here in this workshop. Um, it's nice to be back in Cambridge. Um, and so I would like to apologize to um, those who gave talks last week, um, as I couldn't attend uh, in person or online. All right, so what I would like to talk about today is uh, John work with uh, uh, two students, Wai Chen and uh, Bo Yang Shu, and a, a colleague of mine, uh, Bob Gilbert. All right, so um, let me start with some motivation. And again, I'm, I'm afraid um, I'm going to repeat uh, a number of things from previous talks, but I think it's important for the introduction. So observations suggest that uh, wave energy decays uh, exponentially with distance into the marginal I zone. So something like that uh, for the wave energy spectrum. And so in view of large scale wave forecasting, and uh, I would like to emphasize uh, large scale, uh, there's a, a need uh, for models to represent uh, this uh, attenuation, in particular to predict the uh, attenuation rate alpha, which is a function of frequency and other parameters. All right, so uh, in the uh, literature, uh, there have been um, two major uh, types of uh, models to do that, uh, mostly 2D, uh, mostly uh, linear. Um, on one hand, you have discrete flow models um, where individual flows with possibly distinct characteristics are resolved, uh, usually assuming a simple geometry. Um, the focus here is on wave scattering, and uh, uh, Vernon has made a uh, significant contributions uh, on this aspect. Uh, on the other hand, and I would like to pay more attention to uh, this uh, second type of models, you have continuum models um, where the uh, heterogeneous ice field uh, is viewed as a uniform uh, material uh, with effective uh, rheological properties such as uh, viscosity or viscoelasticity. And these model can potentially include uh, both conservative and non-conservative uh, mechanisms of um, wave attenuation, uh, scattering, and uh, dissipation. Uh, so a lot of work has been done uh, on this, but let me uh, highlight uh, a few references. So uh, Keller and uh, De Caolis and uh, Desiderio, who model uh, wave attenuation as a viscous effect, um, Wang and Chen, who added uh, elasticity, as this may be uh, relevant uh, when you have large flows. Uh, Jiao and Chen, who extended the previous work to uh, three layers. Uh, Mo Sigan and collaborators, um, who proposed a uh, simple viscoelastic model uh, in the uh, thin plate approximation. Uh, Sutherland and, and co collaborators uh, who propose an even simpler model, essentially based on uh, viscosity. Um, and so, in, in this spirit, um, I would like to talk about a, a recent uh, pro viscoelastic model uh, by uh, Chen and collaborators. Uh, and you can think of it as uh, an extension or continuation of, um, uh, of previous work. And as you may guess, it's more complicated than uh, previous models. Uh, and um, uh, going back to what I said about uh, wave forecasting, where usually people would prefer a simple model, I realized that. So, um, uh, so we're, we're kind of like uh, swimming uh, against the stream here. But anyway, um, so we had fun working on this problem. Um, I think it has um, some interesting features. Uh, I think we get some interesting uh, results and I would like to talk about this today. 
So uh, I think uh, you, you, you all know by now that um, wave attenuation in sea ice is uh, an important problem. It's a pausing problem. Again, I'm repeating uh, maybe uh, 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 some, some previous talks. Um, so as far as continuum models are concerned, um, an advantage is that um, various attenuation processes are parameterized uh, all together and uh, their details are not accounted for. Um, there's a drawback. Uh, the, the values of the, uh, of the effective rheological parameters, they are not known uh, beforehand. And so the models here need to be calibrated uh, against uh, data and therefore they may, be, they may not be um, broadly um, applicable. So, uh, so I'm going to come back to this uh, calibration uh, problem uh, later. So just keep that in mind. All right, so here's a sketch of the uh, continuum setup um, that I'm going to use. Uh, so I'm going to focus on 2D linear, so I'm kind of uh, changing gear from the previous talk. Uh, so uh, this is X, this is Z, water, ice, A at the top. Uh, that's it. Let me say it one more time. The marginal ice zone is viewed as a uniform ice layer of thickness little h with uh, effective uh, poor viscoelastic properties controlled by constant parameters. Uh, the underlying ocean is described as a, a compressible irrotational and inviscid fluid of a finite depth, big H. Um, so let me tell you right away what the important parameters uh, are that we're going to pay attention to. Uh, the, the shear modulus, mu of the ice layer. And again, keep in mind what we're talking about effective parameters. Uh, the kinematic viscosity eta, and uh, this porosity parameter beta, which in our case is between zero and one, so it's a dimensionless parameter, such that uh, when beta is zero, that corresponds to a, a solid phase, and when beta is equals to one, that corresponds to a fluid phase. So I'm going to say more um, about the equations for the, the ice layer, uh, the equations for the ocean beneath, and then the boundary conditions uh, at the top, the interface in the middle, and the bottom. All right, so for the ice layer, so we're going to use bio theory uh, for wave propagation uh, in post media. Um, so it's, it's a little bit misleading. Uh, uh, it's, it's a kind of a mixture or homogenized view. So at any point in the post medium, uh, the, the solid and fluid motions are attracted by the uh, displacement vectors, uh, little u and big U. Uh, these are the corresponding uh, constitutive relations for the, the stress and strain. Uh, you have two of them uh, for the, the solid and the fluid parts. You gotta recognize the, the, the shear stress and the normal stress. It's a bit simpler for the fluid part. Um, lambda, Q, and R, these are additional parameters that depend on the porosity. And I'm going to say more about this later. Uh, little e and little epsilon, these are the corresponding uh, solid and fluid, um, I'm not even sure how to say this word, dilatations. Uh, that means that uh, we take into account uh, compression or stretching. Uh, and we can check that as beta goes to zero, uh, the total stress uh, reduces to the isotropic um, elastic case. So this typical form where Ks is the bulk modulus of the, of the ice. And again, uh, note that the um, the compression and stretching of the ice layer is still allowed in this limit via the uh, solid uh, dilatations. All right, so these are the uh, equations of motion. Again, you have a system because uh, we need to write them down for the, uh, the solid and fluid phases. 
Uh, you can recognize on the left uh, contributions from the elasticity, uh, contributions from uh, gravity. On the other side, you can recognize contributions from inertia. And I, I would like to highlight this uh, additional term on the right-hand side that has this coefficient b and partial t. So therefore, it represents damping. More precisely, uh, frictions. Frictions between uh, frictions due to the uh, relative motion, relative indeed because you have uh, little u minus big U between uh, solid and uh, fluid components of the um, ice cover. And uh, so it's controlled by this um, coefficient uh, little b. And uh, I, I would like to say that it's related to the um, um, porosity parameter peak P that Maltz uh, mentioned uh, in his talk uh, yesterday, but I, I, I can tell for sure. Anyway, uh, it depends on uh, the viscosity, on the uh, porosity, so that makes sense, uh, divided by uh, A square, and A is a, a measure of the size of the fluid pores in the uh, pores medium. And I'm going to say a bit more about this uh, later in the, uh, in the talk. All right, so now um, what, about, what about for the ocean? Um, so we're going to assume that the ocean is slightly compressible. I realize, uh, I think we're probably making our life a bit uh, harder here. We're, we're probably um, uh, adding more physics than uh, what is needed. Uh, I'm not sure there's a deep reason uh, behind this. I, I can't tell, I can't remember why we did that. But anyway, um, uh, in this case, the velocity potential satisfies this uh, wave equation. We see the speed of sound in water. Um, in preparation for what I'm going to tell you next, uh, if you look for plane wave solutions of this form, where omega is the angular frequency and kappa is the complex mode with the uh, the real part being the wave number and the imaginary part being the uh, attenuation rate. So little q, then you can change the wave equation to this uh, second order ODE. And uh, I'm going to come back to this later. You can see that uh, we, we can take care of it uh, analytically. All right, so now what about the boundary conditions? So boundary conditions at the top, at the middle, at the bottom. So at the top, uh, we're going to specify a uh, vanishing of the uh, tangential stress, vanishing of the solid normal stress, vanishing of the fluid normal stress. Uh, in the middle, uh, we're going to impose continuity of vertical displacement. And by the way, eta one, eta two, these are the function describing the, uh, the top surface and the interface. What else? Uh, vanishing of the uh, tangential, tangential stress, continuity of the solid normal stress, continuity of the fluid normal stress. And finally, um, at the bottom, the, the standard um, boundary conditions uh, about the vanishing of the uh, fluid flux. So egg boundary conditions. All right, so let me pause a little bit. Uh, so, uh, so this is our model. Uh, it's uh, it's clearly uh, yes. Just one question, Philly. Sorry, I, so I, I didn't quite. So you have the equations for elastic solid with the main parameters lambda and mu. Yeah. So so, but we also have the Dorsey law. So is it? Are you? I just uh, just for understanding. So basically, you think of the ice sheet, which is broken ice, as a, a elastic solid. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Um, all right, so this is our model. Uh, it, it's clearly complicated. Um, so next, uh, let me say a little bit more um, about um, how we can try to, uh, to solve this. Uh, and hopefully you're going to see that there's some uh, nice uh, structure uh, behind the equations. All right, so... Uh, for, for the ice layer, um, uh, if you introduce this decomposition for a little u and big u, 
uh, in terms of a uh, rotational component and uh, an irrotational component and the corresponding um, uh, potential functions. Uh, and again, uh, as before, if you um, look for plane wave solutions of, of this form, uh, then you can reduce your system of PDEs to uh, uh, these uh, big systems uh, of uh, ODEs for the, the corresponding um, potential functions. Uh, uh, the equations for the, uh, the, um, the, the solid part uh, are a little bit more complicated than the equations for the, uh, the, the free part. So let me start with, with that first. So if you, if you make this change of variables to tau and, and, and sigma, and I apologize, probably I should not be using this notation. It looks like the shear stress, but anyway, if you do that, uh, then you can write down the corresponding equations by using the previous systems and by making substitutions. And furthermore, if you take the uh, Laplacian and you make further substitutions, then you end up with uh, these two decoupled uh, identical equations for tau and sigma, which is pretty, pretty cool. Uh, it's, it's basically the same equation for uh, either one, all right? And then if you substitute the uh, biharmonic operator delta square with this, taking into account the fact that we're looking for plane wave solutions, then you end up with this fourth order ODE for either tau or sigma, which again, it's, uh, it's pretty cool a fourth derivative, a second derivative, and then tau itself on the left-hand side. It's pretty cool because you can write down the general solutions. You have these four contributions. Again, it's exactly the same general solutions for sigma. You can deduce the corresponding expressions for the uh, velocity put, uh, functions. Uh, now, uh, for the, the free part, uh, as I showed you earlier, the system is simpler. So therefore, the, the corresponding ODE is simpler. You can also write down the corresponding uh, general solutions. And you can do the same thing for the, uh, for the equations for the, for the ocean. And the corresponding uh, general solutions is up here. So, uh, and so in the end, uh, what you do is that you insert all the expressions in the egg boundary conditions. And that leads you to a, a homogeneous algebraic linear systems for the eight uh, constants C1, C2, up to uh, C8. And that's why I bothered you with all the eight boundary conditions earlier. And so if you do that, this gives you this uh, linear dispersion relation for the problem between kappa and omega for gravity waves in a porous viscoelastic ice layer. Uh, so it, it, it looks like uh, the, 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 the typical form that Mike showed us uh, yesterday. Uh, with this omega square on the left-hand side. Uh, the way I present it is a bit misleading because uh, those coefficients T1, T2, and T3, in fact, all depend on omega and kappa and other parameters. So in fact, omega is all over the place. Kappa is all over the place. And uh, they, they, they have lengthy expressions and I'm going to spare you the details. So next, um, uh, I would like to tell you how we, we solve this numerically. Uh, maybe before that, um, uh, let me say a few words about the, all the parameters involved in this, uh, in this problem. Uh, and in fact, we're going to make our, our life uh, even harder. Um, so we're, we're going to uh, uh, augment uh, the, uh, the system with what I call bulk viscosity by replacing the shear modulus by its complex version uh, like that according to uh, uh, the, the void uh, approximations. It's a common trick. Um, so this allows us to have uh, viscosity damping within uh, each of the phases in the pulse medium. Uh, and these are the expressions for uh, the, the parameters that I showed you uh, earlier, if you're, if you're interested. And these are their definitions. So, so note that uh, if you're given beta, mu, eta, and nu, which is the Poisson ratio, then you can ev evaluate all the other parameters. So that's why we tend to focus on that subset of parameters. All right, so uh, numerical solution of the uh, dispersion relations. Uh, 
So we do that numerically. Um, is root finding. Um, because there are multiple possible routes for K and Q, we apply the uh, selection criteria proposed by Wang and Chen to find a dominant pair, K and Q, that represents a physically relevant solution. So we choose uh, K and Q such that K is closest to the uh, open water value and a Q, which is the uh, lowest um, attenuation rate um, possible. Uh, and uh, for the uh, preliminary test that I'm going to show you next, uh, I'm going to use these uh, typical values for the, uh, for the parameters. So please uh, don't pay too much attention to that. That's just for the purpose of the, uh, of the test. So we're in some sort of uh, deep uh, water uh, conditions. All right, all right, so very quickly, uh, purely elastic case. So the, the point of the test is just to make sure that the model predictions behave reasonably well in some limits. Uh, purely elastic case, beta equals zero, eta equals zero, uh, wave number. So uh, there's a, a tendency to converge to, um, from uh, open water to uh, uh, elastic plate when H, the thickness is increased. And similarly, uh, uh, there's a tendency to uh, go from uh, mass loading, so ML is mass loading, to uh, the elastic plate when uh, the, the shear modulus is increased. Uh, Normalized uh, wave number, uh, attenuation rate, uh, again, when you vary, um, the ice uh, thickness, and uh, you see that there's a tendency to converge here to um, WS, so Wang and Chen, which makes sense because it's also a, uh, a layer model. So this is, again, normalized wave number, attenuation rate. Uh, and so this is in the, uh, uh, viscous uh, elastic case, uh, as, as, as before, I forgot to mention that before, sorry about that. Um, and so uh, there's nothing much happening um, on the wave number when you vary the uh, viscosity. However, there's a, a big influence on the attenuation rate, as we may expect. And now finally, I'm going to include some porosity. Porosity um, without friction, with frictions. So apparently, uh, uh, friction is a big deal, especially on the uh, attenuation rate. I'm going to say more about this uh, in a few minutes. The other thing is that uh, if you're familiar with this kind of problem, it looks like there's some sort of non-monotonic behavior of Q, the attenuation rate as a function of frequency. It goes up and then tends to uh, go down. And this is especially clear when the porosity is high. Uh, and again, I'm going to come back to this uh, later. All right, so these were for the, um, so th this was for the, uh, the, the preliminary, preliminary test. Okay, so now let's move on to uh, the, the calibration. Uh, maybe calibration is not the right word, at least not extensive calibrations, uh, but we did compare with a, a range of um, experimental data covering a, a range of uh, different type of uh, ice cover. So maybe not calibration, maybe some assessment. Um, for a change, uh, we're going to make life a bit easier. We're going to uh, set mu to, um, not mu, mu to 0.4. And as I said, or as I tried to uh, um, emphasize earlier, we're going to focus our attention on uh, this subset of parameters, porosity, shear modulus, and uh, viscosity. When fitting to the, uh, when fitting the model, predictions to the uh, experimental data. Uh, in particular, two of them are in common with the um, EFS um, and uh, WS model, so uh, Mossig and coworkers and Wang and Chen. And so when we fit, um, we would like to uh, minimize this error on the uh, attenuation rate. And so as a result, the fit is going to return a set of uh, values 
for the attenuation rate, as well as the uh, triplet uh, beta, mu, and eta for these uh, rheological parameters. Uh, so we're going to compare with a, a selection of lab experiments with different kind of uh, ice covers, uh, New Year's Martin, Wang and Chen, Zhao and Chen, um, and a selection of uh, field observations um, from Wadhams and all, uh, and uh, so in the Arctic, and uh, Gohu Melan and, and all from the uh, Antarctic. So um, in um, a, a number of these experiments, it turns out that an estimate of the mean ice concentration C is reported. So that's going to make our life a little bit easier. And so we're going to define beta, the porosity parameter, as one minus C, the complement to the ice concentration. And so this allows us to assign the value to beta and that's nice because uh, it's, uh, it allows us to include information about the ice concentration in our model. So it's a, it's a nice feature, I think, and, and I think that's, uh, that's, uh, that is absent from um, the previous um, viscoelastic uh, models. However, the pause side, and I think I lied a little bit earlier on the previous slide, um, we, we're also going to uh, estimate the pore, side, uh, pore size A, again, more details later, uh, from the fits. All right. All right, so let's start with the, the data from uh, Nui and Martin. And uh, uh, we're going to compare uh, fits from different models. Um, so CGG, the, uh, the, the pore elastic model, EFS, um, WS, and, and Keller. Uh, so here we're using our own solutions to these models. Uh, so we're comparing with uh, the, the two experiments uh, from these two gentlemen. Um, so overall, uh, I would say uh, good fits, uh, close together, uh, close to the data. So now let's move on to Wang and Chen. Um, not the model, but the, uh, the experiments. Again, two of them. So this is for a mixture of uh, grease and pancake ice. Uh, we're comparing CGG in blue, EFS in green, WS in red, and SRCJ, so Sutherland and, and, and R. Uh, again, I would say the same comments, uh, close together, uh, similar, um, good agreement with the, the, the data overall. And note that uh, the, 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 the simple model of the Sutherland and, and, and R is doing a, a pretty good job. Pretty good job for such a simple model. Uh, so now let's move on to uh, Zhao and, and Chen. Uh, so in this case, we have three experiments. Again, we're comparing, um, we're comparing the same models as before. Uh, Again, the same comments. Uh, all right, so, um, so now let me, uh, let me move on to, uh, so we're done with lab experiments. So now let me move on to uh, field observations. So this is uh, uh, the data from um, Green and C, uh, 1979, from uh, Wadhams and, and R, 1988. Uh, an interesting feature, um, in this data set is that it looks like uh, there's a uh, non-monotonic behavior of the uh, attenuation rate um, as a function of uh, frequency. So you have this uh, hump here um, that is re usually referred to as a uh, rollover in the uh, literature. And it seems to be uh, reasonably well reproduced by uh, the, the poor elastic model. I have to say, I should say, uh, there's, there's still some debate uh, about what exactly causes uh, this uh, roll rollover. So effects from nonlinear wave interactions, some wave reflections from the coast, uh, from the, coast um, the wind, so have been suggested. Uh, 
And also there's a, a, a recent analysis by Thompson and, and all showing that uh, this may be just some artifact uh, due to noise in the uh, measurements. Uh, so you, you have, so you, you need to be careful when, when you try to uh, interpret this uh, comparison. And you can see that there's uh, some large uh, error bars on, on the right hand side. But anyway, uh, regardless, uh, the, the point that I'm trying to make here with this uh, comparison is that at least from the modeling point of view, uh, the, there's some indication that the, uh, the, the rollover is uh, possible. And that's what the uh, poroelastic model shows. Uh, same thing for uh, the data from the Bering Sea, 1983. Uh, the, the blue curve is not as good as before, but again, you, you can recognize some sort of uh, world over. So this is uh, in comparison to the data from the uh, Antarctic, uh, so Kohu, Melan, and, and all. Um, there's no world over here. Um, I think the, uh, the, um, the, the range of frequencies is, is slightly different. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm showing the, uh, the plot, not versus frequency, but versus um, wave period. The EFS uh, is clearly a, uh, a favorite. It does the better job here, especially at longer wave uh, period. but otherwise uh, not too bad for um, all three of them. Um, so here, this is a table to just um, uh, summarize uh, the uh, estimated values for the parameters uh, mu shear modulus and eta viscosity from the three models, CGG, EFS, and WS, for all the cases that we have uh, considered, including lab experiments and uh, observations. I don't expect you to read uh, this in, in detail. The main message here is that um, uh, we get pretty large values uh, for EFS, which in fact is consistent with what they, uh, uh, they, they found in their uh, own previous uh, study. And also for CGG, um, if you look at the, uh, the, the spread in the values for both parameters, uh, it, it, it's not too big. All right. Let's move on. And now let me, let me say maybe a little bit more about um, this uh, concept of uh, pore size. Um, so, uh, so this is a, a, a sort of, on the right-hand side, a, a bird's eye view of a, a piece of some marginal eye zone. And I, I think you can make a case, at least in the context of this pore elastic model, uh, so we, we, we don't have any flow size, at least directly, uh, among the, the parameters. But I think you can, you can make a case that uh, the pore size A that is explicitly in the model, uh, you, you, can, you can associate uh, this parameter to uh, area of open water uh, in the marginal eye zone. All right. And so what we found from the fits is uh, these numbers for A. So when it's about lab experiment, sorry, uh, I don't know what happened here. So when it's about lab experiments, uh, again, if you don't pay too much about the exact values of this uh, parameter A, but just uh, the order of magnitude, if you wish. So um, when it's about the lab experiments, uh, it's relatively small, and that may make sense if you're talking about grease ice or pancake ice. But now if you're talking about broken flow fields, then you get a much uh, bigger values. We did some sensitivity test very quickly. So just to vary the parameters and see what happens. And we just pick uh, uh, Bering Sea data because they, they, look, they look very interesting. Uh, the main message uh, is that uh, there seems to have, um, there seems to be some um, strong dependence on uh, thickness, shear modulus, and maybe porosity. Okay. All right, so uh, I think I'm, I'm done. Summary, uh, summary. Um, you can read. 
uh, summary. So a, a lot of stuff. Sorry about that. Uh, also future work. Unlikely. I'm joking. Um, and I'm going to stop with that. Thank you very much for your um, attention. And if you're interested, uh, these are references. Okay, thank you, Philip. Uh, are there any questions? Um, Alberto? Yeah, I mean, it's a complicated model, right? Yes. And I, you mentioned that, that if you want to put in the model, it's probably the wrong way to go. But when you mentioned the uh, porosity and the pore size, especially when you look at the experiment of Wang and Shen, if I remember the picture from those experiments, it's sort of continuous. You don't have those holes that you show in the field when you have those pancake size flows. So it seems to me fairly big that pore size equal to four centimeters that you add in. Mm. What? It's, so don't you lose a little bit the, the physical sense? What you're trying to? Sh I don't know. What's your uh, opinion? For the uh, for Wang and Shen 2010. Yeah. Right. So if I remember correctly, uh, yeah, uh, the. Uh, the ice cover was a mixture of grease and pancake ice. And so, um, so on that last slide about the pole side, what I was trying to say is that, uh, yeah, if, if, you try to, uh, if you try to interpret A, the pole side, in the context of these experiments, again, you can think of this as just some areas of open water. Uh, again, it's just some analogy. But at least uh, in the estimates, you see some sort of correlation in the fact that uh, A is small. So if, you, if we have gotten a big A, like 100 meters for Wang and Shin experiments, we would have worried. Okay, so back to your question about the physics. Um, again, it's a, it's a, it's a, a, a sort of a homogenized view model model of the of the problem but at least there's some sort of consistency okay it is a complicated model <laughs> um as i said yesterday I, I i do admit to some discomfort in using a complex modulus for the reasons i talked about yesterday where you're going to get this rather artificial effect um, but my main question is really around the choosing of the primary wave um, where you use the Wang and Shen yeah. um, method. Mossig and et al. looked at that and discovered, um, well, firstly, the, as, as is obvious, and it will be worse for your model, there are a vast number of waves generated in the model. That's true. There, there are, I don't know, let's say hundreds of routes in, in the complex plane that represent waves. And choosing the principal one is, is delicate, let me yes. say. Um, but Mossig also found that uh, with certain parameters, certain physical parameters chosen, um, the route finder would select the wrong route. Did you get any evidence of that? And I'm also presuming that the, the fact that you have a compressibility condition will increase that complexity. So you can get other kinds of waves generated because of the, complex, because of the, the uh, compressibility in the fluid. Yeah, yeah. So uh, as I said earlier, so yeah, the model is complicated, and we, we um, yeah, we we definitely uh, uh, made our, our life um, uh, more complicated by by adding all this uh, this physics into the um, into the problem, and as a result, as you just pointed out, um, when you try to solve the dispersion, the corresponding dispersion relations, you should expect. Million, or I don't know, 
I'm kind of making it up, but uh, a lot of possible solutions. So we definitely need something to help select uh, the, the solutions that interest it. And if possible, as simple uh, as possible. And so we use, um, we use uh, Wang and Chen, um, at least uh, initially just to, 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 to give it a try and see how, how we can go with it. And uh, I don't know, it, it worked great, at least from the fits that we, that we, uh, that we found. Um, we, we, we uh, yeah. Uh, so, sure. so we, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't uh, encounter any uh, big need to, uh, to upgrade from those uh, criteria. Thank you for your presentation. Um, there were several presentations um, last week, this week, on about the attenuation. And it seems that uh, from the presented solutions, it seems that there are no kind of a right direction to the solution. So yes. the, no, no, I didn't finish. So, <laughs> so from that point of view, a question, uh, the, my question is, is the question itself is formulated right? So sometimes you can formulate like that attenu attenuation rate or that alpha with so much, I mean, not me, not we, but uh, uh, presenters so much stick to that. And they are trying to find it, but potentially there are nothing such thing as that. Or potentially it's so complicated to find that we should forget about it. Yeah. Yeah. So, what, <laughs> one comment. So the, to solve problem, we need to uh, analyze also the original question. And as to me, it seems that just question not rightly, uh, not formulated in the right way. And people just spending, uh, you know, energy. Uh, yeah. Okay, I cannot say for nothing. <laughs> okay, this is the second part of my <laughs> comment. The, normally, I suggest to use the as simple model as possible. So your model is complicated. Okay. However, in your case, I would suggest to use even more complicated model. Because uh, it seems that, and it's the same um, we discussed uh, yesterday uh, when uh, Malte Peter did his presentation about porous plate. There are two types of uh, plate or surfaces with uh, liquid which can penetrate through it, its pores and also perforated plate. And nobody plates or surface and nobody uh, 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 using that model of uh, perforated surface. And in your case with the um, that uh, ice uh, uh, flows, uh, the uh, perforated model, uh, uh, it could be better in perforated model, the uh, change of death, uh, uh, change of or oh, jump of uh, pressure through the surface is proportional to velocity square. Not in, is in, as in porous model proportional to velocity. If so, if to use it, uh, it's also a good model. But the uh, advantage of that is that uh, in a um, perforated model, you account for vortex shedding. And vortex shedding is, uh, uh, if you scale it, uh, it's uh, uh, velocity squared. It's not velocity. So the disadvantage is that all linear model cannot be used, right? So that is the something, but I believe this is also one of important mechanism and could be more important that, that uh, um, I'm not sure, but could be just epsilon and epsilon squared, which come from porosity or viscosity or wind, as you said, uh, and other issues. So, so too complicated. <laughs> so you want to make the model more complicated? A, and could be more phys uh, or, uh, physically more reasonable. Physically more reasonable because the, I, uh, uh, my feeling after many presentations is that uh, the vortex shading is missing in the models, right? But what vortex shading is non linear phenomenon, and it's a rather standard for floating bodies to uh, dumping of floating bodies in waves. The you should account for that vortex shading, but here. Nobody is using that because it, it seems that uh, we are uh, based on continuous ice model. But so we do not account that the uh, that uh, pieces of ice they are with edge, 
and that age they're moving uh, with respect to water and they, there is a vortex shedding. And uh, sometimes in some models the vortex shedding is more important than even added mass. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I hate to disagree with Sasha. <laughs> yeah. I, I agree. I actually agree with him that vortex shedding is important. And I agree that um, we need a V squared type model. However, um, my own experience um, of actually being on the ice suggests that there are many other dissipative processes occurring. And vortex shedding is just one of them. So um, the question is, uh, is vortex shedding the, the main one or are there other processes acting? For example, um, certainly in the outer regions of the marginal ice zone, the flows are colliding constantly. They're bashing over one another, they're riot rafting over one another and they're bashing together and they're destroying. I mean, that's got to be dissipating energy. Um, further in, those processes are less because the waves are, are attenuated. But there are at least six or seven processes I can write down. Why we should select B squared, why we should select um, vortex shedding as being the principal one, I have no idea. I think we have to parameterize in a much more general way. So I agree with Sasha, but I also disagree with Sasha. <laughs> And Thank by the way, I also want to, um, that reminds me of your uh, first questions about uh, viscosity uh, in the complex shear models. Uh, in some, I think I agree. Uh, so if you remember one of the uh, earlier slides that I showed, um, it seemed like it's more the, the frictions term that matters. And that friction term is, uh, is not independent of uh, that uh, imaginary part in the shear modulus. So I agree, I agree with you in that sense. It's really more that term than really viscosity in the complex shear modulus. So again, we were just making our life harder uh, for some reason, but- uh, Yeah, anyway. I totally agree with that. Um, and I like to see that friction stuff. I, I just want to go back to what I said about um, the Wang and Chen criterion for selection. What Mossig found, are you familiar with Mossig's paper? He did a sensitivity study of the Wang and Chen and what actually happens if you really analyze um, the sensitivity of the roots to the physical parameters is that it is possible that the preferred choice, the principal wave that you're selecting out, the, um, the, the curves come together in the complex plane and then the principal root goes down another branch so it doesn't necessarily go down the branch that you particularly want to. So it's very easy to think that the model is actually working when it isn't because you're tracking along a different branch which actually corresponds to a shear wave yeah, yeah. instead of a flexure wave or some other weird and wonderful route <laughs> that yeah, yeah. Um, we would have to investigate yeah, yeah. Uh, carefully. Yeah, I agree with that. But again, back to, um, back to what I was showing, so we, we, we use the same thing for EFS and we're kind of able to reproduce basically your results. So that was encouraging and, and uh, that's why we didn't think of really using some different criteria at that time. But yes, I agree that uh, there may be a need to uh, uh, use uh, some uh, other uh, criteria. Thank you. Okay. If there are no any more questions, let's thank Philip again. Thank you. And I think uh, we have a break, a lunch break until uh, two o'clock. Yeah.